I just came to say goodnight. Oh. I'm still turned on. Oh, the world of adult animation. Ow, my dick! It's had a crazy life so far. I mean, back when animation started, there wasn't any stigma yet about it being just for kids, so all animation was for everyone. But times changed, the industry grew, cartoons stopped wearing blackface, and eventually with the rise of Disney and others like them, animation began to start being seen as just kid stuff. Despite the fact that they were all made by caffeine-fueled adults dreaming of the next time they would see their beds. So, as time went on, we entered the phase of segregating the world of cartoons into kids stuff and adult stuff. A sort of Jim Davis Crow era, if you will. Oh, that's clever. That's very clever. That's a clever one. For a while, the main places to get adult animation, at least TV animation, was Fox, Comedy Central, Adult Swim, and MTV. Sure, there was the odd show on, like, USA or, like, the few times Nickelodeon tried to branch out. I really thought Glenn Martin would be a game changer. Who's my pal? You are. Yes, you are. <laughs> Never quite get used to that. Whoa, ass ahoy. But then streaming went and became a thing, and suddenly, we had a lot more places to find new adult animated series. Sure, they weren't all stellar, and a few have caused some controversies, and I think Campus PD stabbed me in a parking lot one night, but for the most part, it was cool getting to see all these new shows being cranked out. While platforms like Netflix have your Big Mouths and Bojacks, and HBO Max has, oh wait, I'm, I'm sorry, Max, good to know we're on a first name basis, has, or at least had stuff like Close Enough and Velma. I never really saw the shows made for Hulu get anywhere near as much love, or even hate, and the internet loves to do that. But I was always watching, and I think Hulu has one of the most interesting collections of adult animation out there. All great? Nah, not really, but definitely interesting. So today, I want to look over every single adult animation that Hulu has ever put out, and figure out which is the best, the worst, and every spot in between. I'm your host. Host, an unskippable ad, D'Angelo Edwards, and today we're ranking every Hulu adult animation and taking my hat off to the best one. I don't, I don't know. I didn't think this out. Oh man, who would have thought that the first one of these I ever watched would end up at the bottom of this list? Yep, turns out that this wasn't going to be tough. The bottom of the ranking is Mother Up. I think that the best thing about the show is the way it was pitched. When asked to explain the show, it was described as, get this, family guy, <laughs> but for women. <laughs> That is some big pen, weird, sexy, razor robot, hungry man dinner nonsense. Where are you ladies going? Now I'm all for a little gender pandering every now and again. I still love that old Burger King commercial that tells you to eat like a man, because I'm a big beefy dude that eats big beefy steaks like a big boy. Biggest boy. But just having the main lead be a girl does not make it family guy for women. Because what does that even mean? Don't think being a lady makes a bag of weed any funnier. Now prom night dumpster baby on the other hand? Anyway, Mother Up is about a former music executive named Rudy, who, in her efforts to cover up the fact that she hunted children for sport, long story there, decides to blame her boss and retire to take care of her own two kids, who she barely knows anything about. Mommy! Hug zone, hug zone! Mm -hmm. 
We follow her as she learns to be a better mom, dominates middle class suburbia, and mothers up. Now before I get into what got it here at last place, I do want to say some nice things about it. You guys know me, I don't like to trash on things without recognizing the things I actually like. And even if I think it's the weakest show on the list, I definitely wouldn't say I hate it. First off, this show comes from Canadian animation royalty, being produced by Breakthrough Entertainment. The same people who brought us heavy hitters like Atomic Betty and Jimmy Two Shoes. They also did Captain Flamingo. I remember a few years back I had a guy come to set up my internet and I was watching some old Jetix that I had recorded and in that moment I realized that I was the only person alive watching this show in this exact way and I think about that a lot. I hope that guy does too. But this show does come from good stock or at least like competent stock. So it's animated fairly well. It's one of the few Rick cartoons that I've seen that actually have line weight in the characters, and it looks pretty decent. A lot of it feels like they're taking cues from Archie, at least with the more important characters. I won't lie though, some of those incidentals look busted. <laughs> The main character, Rudy, though, does look a little out of place. Something about her color palette and her fairly normal proportions. I feel like this might have been done on purpose, though, since she's the fish out of water in this story. She's played by Ava Longoria, who was also one of the show's executive producers, and she does a pretty good job. She's sassy, confident, and at times can actually be a pretty sweet mom. You know, when she isn't spiking her kids' veggies with nicotine spray. But it's cool, we all make little mistakes. I mean, just look at Rudy she made two. <laughs> I've always been a fan of her voice, so she definitely helps to carry the show of her delivery. My new Mercedes is way too beautiful. How can I compete with that aqua pearl finish? All I've got is this lousy skin colored skin. But besides the nice enough character designs and her voice acting, there really isn't that much to say about Mother Up. Going back to this show, I hardly remembered any of it. And now I can see why. It's like majorly forgettable, which is crazy because if you take your eyes off of it for one second, you go from scenes like this. Ah, you must be Rudy and Apple. I'm Greg Simmons, the kid's swim instructor. The scenes like this. So much wacky stuff happens, but it kinda lacks impact cause the animation and other voice actors can't really keep up. I especially dislike the voices they got for her kids. I know kids voices are like constantly changing, but the voices they do for these guys are super annoying, especially when binging the show. I pretty much never got used to hearing Apple, her daughter. I don't know any of these kids. Can I change my name to girl who fits in? Her son Dick is a little better, but still kind of forgettable. I don't mind her neighbors though. Sarah is pretty chill being a super mom who's pretty much at Rudy's beck and call, and Greg who same but in dude flavor. There's also Rudy's former client, 2-Bit, who I think is a parody of both 2 Chains and Kanye, a uh, pre-current era Kanye. Every human being has something of value that they brought to the table. Especially Hitler. You can tell he was meant to be the breakout star of the series, with him getting into the craziest situations and saying the wildest stuff. But even a vaguely stereotypical black man wasn't enough to give this series the edge. And it was cancelled after only one season. Which makes sense to me. I think they pretty much got everything they could out of it. And it was a cool idea, trying to make a show that could poke fun in motherhood while also celebrating it. But the execution was so lacking that it kinda just fizzled out. If for some reason you want to check it out for yourself and don't have Hulu, you can find it on Breakthrough Entertainment's YouTube channel, where for some reason it has a different theme song. I don't know, maybe a license ran out. Can't tell which one I like more though. Both pretty solid. Hello to the perps. Things are getting rough and life is getting tough. These kids are driving me crazy. A few moments later. No way! I'm doing Pilates! But as it stands, I think Mother Up is gone for good, which is probably for the best. Because if you want a family guy for women, just watch Family Guy, weirdos. Whoop, class is starting. <laughs> well, that's a lovely udder. And those are teats. We don't need to say that word, Daryl.
Okay, this one is weird because I thought for sure it would be at the bottom of the list. Little Kenny is a series about a group of kids going to school in rural Canada, mostly following the adventures of Wayne, Daryl, Katie, and Dan. It's paced weird, the kids talk weird, and to be honest, it's probably the worst animated show on the list. For all of these reasons, and because I had been watching cartoons for nearly 10 hours straight, I didn't think too highly of it. But I didn't want it to end at that, mostly because YouTube likes longer videos now, and your boy needs to get paid. So I looked a bit more into it, and learned that it was actually an animated spin-off to a very popular long-running live-action series called Letterkenny. Since I wanted to get a better understanding of the show, I decided to give an episode a watch. And then I watched a season of it. And then I watched two seasons of it. And then I watched three Okay, you can see where this is going. In fact, while you're watching this video, I'm probably still watching Letterkenny because I love this show. This might be one of the funniest shows I've ever seen in my life. Nice onesie. Is it coming men? Oh, I think you come in men enough for all of us. Every episode is better than the last, and there isn't a single joke that doesn't land at least a little. No. Why not? Because it's too complicated. It's like algebra. Why you gotta put numbers and letters together? Why can't you just go fuck yourself? Leatherkenny follows Wayne, Daryl, Katie, and Dan as they brave the rough world of rural Canadian living while protecting their rep and keeping the peace. And it is a perfect show. I've never been that into rural comedies, besides the odd dealing with Lawrence the Cable Gentleman, but I think it's because I never experienced Canadian rednecks. That was the missing piece. The way their specific slang just never stops coming, the perfectly delivered lines told with the straightest of faces. Oh, well, there's nothing better than a fart. Except kids falling off bikes, maybe. Fuck, I could watch kids fall off bikes all day. I don't give a shit about you, kid. And the fact that even though these are supposed to be hicks, nearly every person in town is super well-spoken, educated, and witty, but they just like the simple life. These people could be running the government, but they just choose life on the farm because it's what they like. It's perfect. I can't think of any other way to describe it. It's insane how much I like it. Which brings me back to Little Kenny. Now that I've watched Letter Kenny, Little Kenny is like way more funny because I know who these kids grow up to become. It's funny seeing Little Wayne act like such a tough customer. It's cool getting to see the first party that led to the tradition of throwing the softest birthday ever every year. And the fact that one of the most outspoken characters in the show used to be this super quiet little girl is hilarious. But that's also the reason why it's so low on the list. I don't think it would be fair to rate it higher since, without context, I don't think it's that good. Doesn't really stand on its own when you haven't seen Letterkenny. So while I wouldn't recommend Little Kenny to anyone if they just wanted to jump in, I am begging everyone to finish this video, leave a like and comment, and go watch Letterkenny. It uh only works if you do it in that order. Works even better if you subscribe. Just saying. Got to say that's what I appreciate about you. So pitter patter, let's get at her bros. Go watch Leather Kenny. And if you got time, watch Little Kenny after. You know, when it actually makes sense. And that's pretty much all I have to say about it. Wait, hold on. The same studio animated for Smosh Babies? Hold up. Change the ranking. This has to be number one. Stop the camera. Melissa, stop looking at your phone. You're embarrassing me! Why couldn't you just take us straight to school? I'm having a great time, Dad. I can't wait for your funeral. There's a good attitude. Time to change the world. I'm bringing it to its knees! Attack! <laughs> Looks like nowhere you go, there's no way to escape Marvel. There's nothing too short that I can't cameo. So next up is Moda. If you were to ask me which Marvel villain would get their own television show, I don't even think Modok would be number 20 on the list. He's a cool character and I like him enough, but like, I'm freaking King Dweeb of Dork Mountain. Of course I like Modok, but dude has gotta be one of the least accessible looking Marvel characters out there, besides like, Sugar Man, who I also know, because once again, it's Geek Central over here. If you tried to bring up Modok casually with normal people, and Amber alert or something might go off or something, I don't know. But I guess what better way to ease the general audience into a character like Modoc than by turning him into a struggling dad voiced by Patton Oswalt. 
Hey, don't look at me like that, it works. MODOK is a stop motion show that follows MODOK as he tries to balance his supervillain lifestyle while raising two kids with his estranged wife. And it's not half bad, especially once it gets going. The show is animated by Stupid Buddy Studios, which I think you can tell at a glance. There's something about that robot chicken style that stands out no matter what. Not to say it looks bad, I actually think it looks pretty good. Much better than Robot Chicken. Way better lighting, the actual animation is pretty solid, and the custom made models help a lot. Though I wish MODOK's eyes went white when he got mad to tie it into the comic books. Just a suggestion though, not gonna dock at any points for that. While I think the show starts off a little slow, feeling a bit more like Robot Chicken than I would like, as the story progresses, and yeah, there is a story, go figure, we really get to know these characters pretty well. We get to see how MODOK built himself up from nothing, and how even once he had the company and power he wanted, he was still treated like a laughingstock in the villain community. Good lord, get out of here! I'm a big deal, I, I just fought Iron Man, I stole his boot! Your ass stole his boot when he shoved it too far inside you! And we see how this affects his life at home, as he puts more and more time and effort into building his notoriety up, and less and less time and effort into keeping the bond between his family strong. His wife grows distant with him, even kicking him out of the house house pretty early on in the series. His daughter barely respects him, even though she takes after him way more than his son, even down to her giant head. That's not the sweet Melissa I know. Oh, it's 100% pure Melissa, mental entity living to induce seriously sinister anarchy? That's not what your name stands for. You were named after Melissa Etheridge and you know it! At least his son still likes him though, but he's kind of just in his own world anyway. Okay, am I seeing this right? Does the toilet- <laughs> The story shifts from focusing on MODOK's life at his company, AIM, and his personal life, where he tries to win his old family life back. With the two often intersecting, it's actually really fun getting to know the MODOK family outside of just MODOK too. His wife Jody starts to provide when MODOK's money starts to tank, and she even does it through her own business. Even writing a book called Jody Finding Your Life, his daughter Melissa shows a real knack for villainy, probably surpassing her own father. And while I didn't like his son Lou at first, mostly due to him being the exact same character as Dewey from DuckTales 2017, and Ben Schwartz did not fit that character design. There's a bunch of fun side characters too like Monica, MODOK's much more competent second in command who eventually becomes his boss after a hostile takeover. She's just so extra, it's hard not to appreciate her. Plus, her fight with MODOK leads to what's probably the best fight scene in the show, so props. MODOK's minions are also really fun, especially Gary, a minion with one arm that's fiercely loyal to MODOK, even though he's the one that blew off his arm. But what's a few arms between friends, right? Some of the other side characters are a bit forgettable though, like the super adaptoid. His role as the family punching bag kinda gets old pretty fast, and they try to give him more to do, but he's not really needed. I guess he just fits that wacky pet role that every family-based animation sitcom seems to have. Look guys, try all you want, but you could never be the king. But yeah, MODOK starts off a little rough, but as it goes on it really finds its footing, which is a shame because it was cancelled after only one season, and it left on a giant cliffhanger. I feel like the second season could have taken everything I loved from the second half of season 1 and expanded on it. At least what we got was entertaining though, but it looks like MODOK actually stood for mechanized organism designed only for cancellation. But, like, spelled with a K, I guess. Look, I'm writing this at 5 a.m. Shut up. Cut to the next one. I said cut to the next Oh, great shiner kid. Way to go. It's a beaut. I know. I know. I should see the other guy. No, he's fine, actually. I'm ashamed of you, I spit on you. When the black community was left on its knees, with no light left to guide us, a magical gift was dropped from the heavens in the form of the Cleveland Show. And in 2012, the Italian community was given that same gift. And if you think the story ends there, you can forget about it. Let me tell you something about a friend of ours named Jimmy. I made the wise guy and the capo with the gambini. But when he found out that they'd be whacking Uncle Cheech, he'd take the boss, he threw him from the 19th floor suite. 
Forget about it is pretty much the reason I started making this video. It just kept popping up on my YouTube page and for some reason I just kept watching it. And I'm not alone because have you seen some of the view counts on their official videos? This 10 year old show is more relevant than stuff that's actually still running. And I don't know whether to applaud or hide in fear. My nose is crying. I'm not used to you saying nice things about me. Now, technically, Forget About It wasn't made for Hulu. It started life over on Teletoon as the winner of a pilot contest. But just like Little Kenny, when it came out over here, it was licensed exclusively to Hulu. So I think it counts. Besides, when else am I going to get a chance to talk about it? You get mad, you can sit and spin. Moving on, let me tell you something about a friend of ours named Jimmy. The main plot of the show is about Jimmy Falcone, a major player in the mob who kills the boss when he he's told to whack his uncle for running his mouth off about mob secrets. So to save both his and his family's skins, he rats out all of his mob buddies and gets placed in the witness protection program. Now the Falcone family is living up north in Regina, Canada, under the new name McDougal's. It's a bunch of silly antics where the family uses their old ways to get by in their new life to varying levels of success. Now I don't really know where to start with this show, I just know I like it. On the surface level, it it probably doesn't seem all that appealing. The character designs are a bit wonky, the writing is crass, and even back then, I don't know how they got away with some of this stuff. Can I please go puke? No. But if I wait too long, the food will digest, and then puking won't do me any good at all. But like, it's still funny. Immature stuff is really funny to me. And I think if you have a good enough head on your shoulders and an unplugged butthole, you can see this show for what it is. A show made by people who were probably just trying to make each other laugh with the most outrageous things you can think of. All I ever got for fooling around with a teacher was an A. Yeah, me too. But then, I went to Catholic school. And again, those numbers don't lie. I think several million people agree with me, even if half of those people only watched it because their Family Guy supercut ended. Also, if you can't find the humor in an episode titled Cookies Overreacting, we just can't be friends, straight up. I think the characters in this are really fun to hang around. Jimmy's old school gangster persona is a bit played out, but the show makes it work by taking him out of his usual environment. What do you mean, trigger? Like how you get when somebody says Pacino's better and De Niro. I just want to kill him! Although, Scent of a Woman was a fine performance. Who said that? I'll kill him! I really like fish out of water stories. I love seeing a samurai in the Wild West or a retail worker in medieval times. And there are a few archetypes that I find more entertaining than Italian gangsters. Anyone who knows me knows that I love Italians, dude. Not like in a making fun of them kind of way, but more so I'm laughing because I find it so charming. That little kid in Duncanville is like my favorite character in the show. I don't know why, I just eat that stuff up. The show does have a bit more going for it though. The family stuff can be really sweet, which makes sense to me considering that the inciting incident of the show is Jim me sticking up for his uncle Cheech, who might be one of the dumbest characters I've ever seen. How do I tell my little boy he's gotta stop doing the only thing he's ever been good at? Get him drunk and a couple of whores, you'll be okay with it. The characters are all pretty stock, but they're all a decent version of what they're trying to be. The nerdy son, the rambunctious kid, the hot daughter, the mom is kinda hot too. And man, they really like to show her off. Oh yeah, your hands are so soft. Hey, that's not fair, cut it out! They censor it, but it's like three or four blurry pixels. I'm pretty sure I get the gist. Pretty sure I saw her gist as well. Ah, waka waka! <laughs> the Mountie that was assigned to protect him is also pretty fun. Always coming up with a new phrase before zooming off on his surprisingly fast horse. I see a lot of people call this Italian family guy, but I see people say this for a lot of things, which makes me think people don't actually know anything about family guy. I was joking earlier, but this show actually is the closest to Cleveland show. Nothing super fantastical happens really, and even with the crazy jokes it stays pretty low key, but I think that helps to make it so easy to watch. But yeah, forget about it definitely won't be for everyone, and I'm pretty sure the feeling I have towards it can mostly be chalked up to Stockholm Syndrome, but it's a decent show. Miles ahead of anything in the Brickleberry family. Well, it's Canadian, so I guess kilometers ahead. Goes to show you that sometimes the low-hanging fruit can taste pretty sweet, if you don't mind spitting out a few seeds. Aw, oh, what the heck, hit that theme again.
Let me tell you something about a friend of ours named Jimmy. Fine! No more lies! The truth is I'm a virgin and I'm scared of you! Just how horny are you trying to make me? The next show is one that actually surprised me the more I watched it. Coming in hot with another Stupid Buddies production, we have Crossing Swords. Do you get it? Like your Jimmy, your Dong, your Disco Stick, your Hairy Canary, your Baloney Pony. Penis. Crossing Swords is a medieval fantasy set in a kingdom where pretty much every citizen, young and old, is the most degenerate psychopath you've ever met. And keep in mind, this is me saying this. And then you have Patrick, our main character. Patrick is the youngest of four siblings, and also the only one of them to actually have a sense of morality. While his sister became a pirate queen, his brother became a bandit, and his other brother became a drunken clown, Patrick had always dreamed of being a knight. So he decided to apply to be a squire, the first step in knighthood, and the story follows the ups and downs of Patrick trying to keep this mess of a kingdom together, while everyone else around him is busy tearing it apart. While the show starts off as pretty much nothing but sex jokes, bloody carnage, and lots and lots of full frontal nudity, I mean, as nude as like tinker toy people can get. Do I have to censor this? It's nothing. If you get turned on by this, you might just have to pack it up, buddy. No saving you. While this is all the show has to offer on a passing glance, which, mind you, I wouldn't be against. The show is still that fun mix of immature comedy and mindless violence that I find pretty entertaining. I mean, I actually thought Santa Inc. wasn't that bad. I have a very high tolerance for garbage. I even watch anime. <laughs> But what starts as just an immature show continues to be that immature show. But it also starts asking really cool questions like stuff about morality, family, and what to do when you achieve your dream and realize that it's nothing like you thought it would be. In this kingdom, basically everyone is terrible and the ones that aren't terrible are too dumb to be terrible. And then you have Patrick who just wants to play by the rules and make the kingdom a better place. But it's hard to play by the rules when all the cheaters keep getting ahead. So Patrick starts playing dirty. He lies, cheats, even kills because he thinks that his actions will lead to the greater good. But does that make him a good person? Or does it make him just as bad as the people around him? It's stuff like this that I think helps Crossing Swords stand out. Not that it ever gets too serious. They even make jokes about how easy it becomes for Patrick to kill people in his way. <laughs> <laughs> Oh god, I am completely numb to violence. You gotta admit, as cool as it is when Arnold delivers an awesome one-liner, from the perspective of the people he's taking out, he's just killing dudes and making jokes about it while he does it. Dude is a nutcase. The show also looks really nice, easily the best looking of the Stupid Buddy productions. The way it's lit and all of the little scratches and imperfections on the characters make it really feel like you're watching a bunch of toys come to life. I also dig the whole VeggieTales way that nobody has hands so stuff just floats in front of them. My favorite thing about how it looks though, is that whenever they do a faraway shot of the characters, everyone looks like this. That is adorable. They didn't have to do that. It's not like in 2D animation when they do it to make characters more recognizable from a distance. They could have just used the same models, but it's little touches like this that really sell the art style. It's good stuff. And there's really too many side characters to go over, but I really like most of them. The king and queen are delightfully corrupt, treating their kingdom as both their own personal bank and brothel. Patrick's trio of villainous siblings are always a hoot, and his parents are some of the best characters in the show. It's really weird watching something you think is genuinely pretty good and seeing the critics just aren't having it. I couldn't believe that this thing has a 27% on Rotten Tomatoes. Not that that means anything since only my opinion matters, but still, people need to pick better targets or maybe watch past episode 5 because I can't understand how we watch the same show. There's a lot more I'd like to talk about, but we'd be getting into spoilers territory and I think that people should actually give this one a watch so I'll end it here. Give Crossing Swords a try and after you do that go out and watch the show too. Oh, it's so hot when you yell at children. I dump a Dixie cup worth of fuck juice in my pants every time you put something on their permanent record. Oh that shit follows them to college. 
Brace yourself. I saw this on stars. Go! Oh, what the f oh. <laughs> Alright, we were gonna have to talk about this eventually, so let's get at it. Solar Opposites is a show created by Mike McCann and disgraced star of Fish Hooks, Justin Roiland. As most of you guys probably know, because you're alive on the planet Earth right now, it's a show that was made to appeal to the already massive audience of Richard and Mortimer. And I won't lie, I like it quite a bit. Solar Opposites is your classic alien stranded on Earth story, and they alternate between trying to take over Earth and trying to fit in. Since their planet blew up, it's their job to terraform the Earth with the help of their pupa. But they would sooner go to a rager or build the ultimate man cave first. What's Diggle Bix? I don't know, some sort of human code. They were out of Tiggled Biddy's signs, but the salesman said it was in the same area, so... You have Corvo, the leader of the team, and the only one who's serious about terraforming the planet. His second in command, Terry, who loves it on Earth and just wants to have a good time. And their two clones, Yumulak and Jesse, who spend most of their time trying to fit in at school. I feel like a lot of people, myself included, thought this would just be Rick and Morty with a new coat of paint slapped on it. But I think it actually stands on its own pretty well, and in some ways, it's even better than Rick and Morty. For one thing, it leans heavily into its episodic nature. A few things here and there carry over from episode to episode, but for the most part, it's a clean slate every new ep. This leads to them doing some pretty out there stuff, like traveling through Christmas specials to learn the reason for the season, or getting sued by a genetically altered pig that they made that produced endless ribs and all the fixings. It's all just a bunch of silly fun that never really takes itself too seriously, unlike Rick and Morty, which sometimes tries too hard to sound smart. I guess that's why it felt so refreshing when I gave it a watch. It felt nice to watch something similar to Rick and Morty without having all the bag that makes Rick and Morty a little hard to get excited for recently. I don't know man, it doesn't usually bother me, but it can get a little annoying when all you're trying to do is watch a cartoon, and on one side you have people saying it's the best thing since sliced Jesus, and on the other side, people are calling you an incel just for laughing at a talking pickle. Gets a little exhausting, but I've already said too much. To be honest, I don't have that much to say about Solar Opposites aside from the fact that I like it. It's just a fun show of really entertaining characters with pretty low stakes. Except that's what they want you to think. Ha! Huh. Did you think I was gonna talk about Solar Opposites without bringing up the masterpiece that is the wall? Nothing doing. In Solar Opposites, there is a small subplot of Yumulak shrinking down anyone who he thinks is mean to him and putting them into a terrarium inside his wall. What starts as a one-time gag leads to one of the most engaging pieces of media that I've seen in a long time. And I am not joking. We get to see these shrunken people start their lives over, build up a society from scratch, and deal with all the trials that come with that. We see a red-shirted nobody lead a rebellion, a Benihana chef overcome Herculean odds, and we learn just how sweet the taste of mouse milk really is. The wall is my favorite part of Solar Opposites, and to be honest, it could probably be its own thing. But I was excited every time we shifted to that perspective. If you want a more detailed look at the wall, you can go and check out my buddy Johnny Tuchello's video on it. Honestly, the wall is the main reason that Solar Opposites is so high on the list for me. If you watch it for anything, watch it for that. Or for those two teachers at the school. Those guys are wild. It's a free country, isn't it? Yeah, for free, for what he said. And what are you gonna do about it? Ah, damn it! Ah, ah. This next one was actually a pretty big surprise, cause I honestly assumed I wouldn't get much out of it. Goes to show that you can't judge a book by its cover. Koala Man is the latest cartoon created by Michael Cusack, the same mind that's partially responsible for the shows YOLO and Smiling Friends. And if you're familiar with those, then you have a pretty good idea of what this show is, but with a few caveats. Starting life as a pilot made for ABC, the Australian one, not the one that signs Whoopi's checks. The show stars Kevin Williams, 
Williams, I mean Kevin Williams, as a man who spends his time working in IT and living with his family, but he possesses a secret. At night, when the ne'er-do-wells are out and about, Kevin takes to the street to dispense his particular brand of mediocre justice as Koala Man. This show is like the definition of growing on you. It was never like bad or anything, but by the end of the first season, I was hooked. It somehow manages to perfectly balance all the crazy and out there stuff with the story of a man who definitely has a few problems he's working through, but is still trying to set an example for people the best way he knows how. But I'm getting a little ahead of myself. The world Koala Man takes place in is a world where Australia has become the number one superpower in the world, with America basically being destroyed, except for Hollywood, which detached and became an island. Honestly, it might not be too far off from what actually happens. America already basically has its tongue stuck down the throat of the apocalypse already anyway, but with this show taking place in Australia, it is aggressively Australian. Much like Michael Cusack himself, dude is from a place called Wollongong. What kind of Dr. Seuss nonsense is that? No disrespect, mostly. While there are a few things non-Australians will be left scratching their heads at, like what on God's green earth is a show bag? If you don't mind doing your didgeridoo due diligence and looking up a few things about the Down Under, there, you'll find that the show being so Aussie really gives it its own flavor. The style of the show is simple but appealing, looking a lot like YOLO but toned down a bit. But every so often you'll just see these characters that really stick out because of how freaky they look. It's not a bad thing though, it just adds on to the humor. I mean, just look at this sausage roll lady that I definitely only had normal thoughts about. Ah, the return of the Y boner with a vengeance. The jokes are really funny too, with characters being so shocked by the situations around them that they kinda just accept it, it's great. I love how absurd this it can get, like the fact that Australia is in a different time zone so they can just make phone calls back to the past and warn people about events. The Titanic never sunk in this world because of that. I mean, sure, a mummy was elected president and the states became a war-torn wasteland, but we got to keep our cool boat. Kevin and his family are really good too. You can tell how much his wife loves him, but is slowly getting fed up with how much time and effort he puts into being Koala Man. And throughout the show, we get to see both of them change, with Kevin learning to put his family first and getting to see his wife rediscover the more wild size she used to have. His son is basically just Pim from Smiling Friends, endlessly optimistic to a fault, though sometimes suffering because of it. And we get to follow his daughter as she ruthlessly takes down every popular girl in her school in her quest to become the ultimate queen bee. But what's really cool is that during all this nonsense, all this absolute chaos of cannibal wiggles and eldritch booty calls, there is a background plot that slowly builds up and leads to a very rewarding payoff that I honestly didn't see coming. I'd say more, but I really think you should watch it for yourself. To be honest, depending on if this gets another season or not, it could end up even higher on this list. I really liked it a lot. If you're a fan of Michael's other shows, then this one should have a lot to offer for you, with a few new twists and turns that makes it stand out from them. Koala Man might not be the hero we need, but darn it, he's the hero that we're kinda stuck with, so why not settle? Fuck yeah. That's my swear for the year spent. Oh, come on. He couldn't beat me in a fight. With all due respect, sir, I think I could. No, you couldn't. Well, you're wrong. Fight! 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 Alright, heading into the final stretch with The Awesomes, a superhero comedy that bridges the gaps between Marvel shows and stuff like The Boys, still portraying the characters doing superhero stuff, but with a splash of reality thrown in there. Created by Mike Shoemaker and Seth Meyers, which is super obvious considering that nearly every main character is voiced by a cast member of SNL, and the ones that aren't come from SNL Jr., Mad TV, which some might say is a superior show. Some might also say it was the only one I watched when I was little because Kid Me found Stuart hilarious. Look what I can do! 
But yeah, this thing is full of SNL royalty. Not just Seth Meyers, who plays the main character, but Keenan Thompson, Bill Hader, Amy Poehler, and many, many more. And while I'm usually in favor of more voice actors getting roles, instead of just celebrity actors, I think everyone here does a pretty good job. The series follows Jeremy Awesome, also known as Prop, because he's both a professor and a doctor, having an MD and a JD. I myself have a PhD, but I can't show you guys because I lose monetization. Proc is tasked with the duty of leading the Awesomes, a superhero team founded by his father, Mr. Awesome. However, after Mr. Awesome decides to retire to space after his 90th birthday, the rest of the team leave as well, forcing Proc to cobble together whatever misfit superheroes he can find. You can't really blame them for leaving though. Proc is super accident prone, and the only power he has, the ability to stop time for a few seconds, could end up killing him if he used it too much. You did stop doing that, right? Yes, I stopped. Stop. <laughs> Start. Good. Now, as the leader of the new Awesomes, we follow Proc as he battles against not only the many supervillains of the world, but also his own insecurities. Back when this came out, I was pretty interested in it. The superhero boom hadn't fully taken over yet, and I had never seen a cartoon with this kind of premise. I mean, I guess maybe the closest thing would be like Harvey Birdman or something, but that's kind of a stretch. This was a show that both poked fun at superheroes, and how if they existed in the real world, they'd be closer to celebrities, and all the red tape they would have to deal with, while also just being a fun superhero show itself. Actually, that might be the reason that everyone is voiced by celebrities, and if that's the case, nice touch. The animation is your bog standard rigged affair, but it's competent. But the actual art style and character designs elevated a lot. Lots of different body types and good silhouettes on display here. I love when adult animation actually attempts to have a more ambitious style. The characters don't only look nice though. As the show goes on, they really get fleshed out, becoming an actual team that works really well together. All of them are really funny too. My personal faves are Concierge. Her design is like really cute and her dry wit never fails to get me. Well, I don't know how they chose the one person lucky enough to stay. I said not it, the slowest. And Gadget Gal never fails to crack me up with her old-timey nonsense. Who wants some nose candy? Gadget Gal. And by that, I mean Dr. Bloomer's nose lozenges. Oh, that's fine then. Made from pure cocaine. As the show goes on, the stakes just keep raising, with Proc and the team having to fight bigger and badder enemies. It's a good thing they managed to keep their energy up with Jack Link's beef jerky. Wait, is this a paid advertisement? Why is Concierge holding that sign? While there can be a few groaners here and there, this show has a lot of heart, and it only got better as it went on. While it ends on a satisfying enough note, it was left open for more, and I think it would be perfect if they did a movie, bump up the animation quality a bit, and were golden. I feel like there's a lot I'm leaving out, but if I talked more about it, it'd just be playing clips of the best jokes and spoiling all the different twists and turns, so I'll leave it at this. The Awesomes is a great show, and it's definitely well worth the watch. Oh god damn! And taking the top spot, surprising nobody, one of the coolest shows to ever grace my eyeballs. That's right, the best adult animated show on Hulu could be none other than the one and only Hitmonkey. I still remember the day they announced this. It felt like someone gave me a hug and whispered into my ear, this one's for you. It is non-stop, pure adrenaline-soaked fun. Starring a monkey with a sword. There was no way this wasn't going to get top spot. Hitmonkey starts when a down on his luck assassin named Bryce Fowler. What a Fowler! Gets a few too many injuries while taking a job. He's taken in by some friendly monkeys who start to nurse him back to health. It's based on the comic book, don't ask questions. There is one monkey, however that seems different from the rest. And as Bryce begins to regain his strength through training, that monkey starts to pick up on his moves. However, the people that injured Bryce track him down and finish him off, and they kill the entire monkey tribe too, just for kicks. 
Well, every monkey except for one. The monkey that studied Bryce's moves had been exiled for getting too violent, and after he fails to save his clan, he vows revenge and heads to Tokyo to kill the boss of the people who slaughtered his family, with Bryce's ghost tagging along for the ride. And from this point on, we jump from one bloody spectacle to the next, and it's a blast the whole time. I love everything about this show, dude. The fact that this random monkey in a suit picked up a few guns and a sword and then just goes on to become one of the most deadly forces around is insane. But I guess it makes sense. I've seen what they can do barehanded. It's like someone took the best part of Nope, set it in Japan, and made a show about it. It all has this great energy to it. The drawings and animation themselves are kind of loose and choppy, but I think it adds to the frantic nature of the show. It's almost like the animation can't keep up with the stuff Hitmonkey is doing, but it's darn sure gonna try and it leads to a pretty refreshing style. I love how this looks and moves. Very unique with a style all its own. And the show does more than just hit the I like violence button in my brain too. We get to see Hitmonkey struggle to find a place to fit in, not really belonging to the world of the humans, but also being unfit to live just like a plain animal anymore. These quiet moments, after all the killing and bloodshed, hit super hard as Monkey reflects on his actions and the things that have led him here, and we see how his journey parallels with Bryce's, who is basically what Monkey is on the road to becoming, and we all see how well that worked out for Bryce. But Monkey doesn't just want to be a killer, he wants friends, he wants compassion, but his thirst for revenge and his violent nature keep getting in the way of things, and those scars just keep piling on. It's those quiet moments that really show what this series is about. I went into Hitmonkey thinking it would be nothing but violence for violence's sake, but it's really the story of a broken man dragging an innocent animal down to his level. The sword and gun stuff is good though too, definitely. More of that please. Honestly, there's a lot I want to say about Hitmonkey, but I'd rather save it for its own video than cram it all in one here. So, I'll call it quits for now. Hitmonkey is my favorite show on Hulu, period. And if you're going to watch anything on this list, then this is the one. And those are the Hulu adult cartoons. Starting from the bottom, we have Mother Up, followed by Little Kitty, Modok, Forget About It, Crossing Swords, Solar Opposites, Koala Man, The Awesomes, and taking its seat at the top is Hitmonkey. You know, after watching through every single one of these, I've kinda gained a new appreciation for Hulu. The original shows it has to offer aren't the most plentiful, but it is one of the most diverse collections of shows on any platform, period. You have rigged shows, stop motion shows, comedies, medieval fantasies, family sitcoms, and even action shows. It almost felt like watching an animation block on TV from back in the day, and it's a welcome feeling. Every one of these shows are a breath of fresh air in one way or another, and even the ones I didn't like as much felt like a welcome change. I'd rather networks do stuff like this and try and experiment more, because even if it fails, it will at least be interesting. That is the only way that this medium can evolve, and it's nuts that Hulu of all places is home to some of the most interesting stuff out there. I never try to limit myself when it comes to the entertainment I consume, because if I do, my taste will stagnate. Of course I have stuff I prefer, everyone does, but it's fun to see if I can find something new I can enjoy. In 2009, I chose to go see The Soloist for my birthday. Me, a little kid who was obsessed with Dragon Ball Z and Ben 10, of my own free will, went to go see a movie about a journalist trying to help a man with mental illness. Completely out of my wheelhouse. But I liked it. And I wouldn't have known that if I had just stuck to the stuff I knew I liked. You spend all your time eating chicken nuggets and you'll never know the taste of steak. And if you try the steak and find out that you still prefer the nuggies, well, at least you know now, and that's valuable as well. So pick up a fork and maybe give one of these a try, because Hulu has laid out a diverse and bountiful spread. And who knows, you might just find a new favorite food. <laughs> 